Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the Attorney General is accused of using state resources for campaign purposes. Several lawmakers are accused of exploiting tragic events to further fundraising and the latest in the Phoenix VA hospital crisis. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal, and Bob Christie of the Associated Press. New accusations regarding Attorney General Tom Horn's alleged use of staff and state resources for his re-election campaign. Uh, Jeremy, we had you on earlier in the week because of uh, the latest round of uh, Sarah Beatty seems to be in the middle of all this. Who is Sarah Beatty and what is she in the middle of? Now, Sarah Beatty, up until a couple weeks ago, was um, worked in the Constituent Services Division over at the Attorney General's office. She was also uh, doing double duty as a campaign volunteer for Tom Horn's campaign, a fundraising consultant. What uh, she alleges is that um, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much double duty as a volunteer, but that it was her actual job at the AG's office to be there to do campaign work. She alleges she was hired strictly, specifically to do campaign work. She got raises, that she got raises for campaign work, and that she's not the only one, that pretty much the entire Horn campaign is being run out of the Attorney General's office with taxpayer-funded employees who are volunteering their time on the campaign. Most of the executive staff, he doesn't actually have any paid campaign staff. He's got some consultants and vendors and other outside people, but the day-to-day -day campaign staff, those are all Attorney General's office employees. And she says that when she was hired, this was made clear to her? And if so, how? Um, she, she says she found out about this job, or her original job was in the community outreach. She found out about this from a friend of hers, Brett Meekum, who was an also an employee of the AG's office. That uh, she sat down with him and with uh, Kathleen Wynn, who was a uh, you know been in the spotlight with, with Horn before, and um, that they said we need you to come on board because we want help with the campaign. She's a fundraising consultant by trade. They thought she, she said they thought she would be a good fit, so she got the job. Uh, before last question on this, before we get to open things up here. They, they said this to her. Did they also, did they wink or they nod? Did they understand what they were saying was completely not kosher? <laughs> Um, well, Beatty says she, she basically understood it and became more aware as time went on of kind of the severity of things. Um, Kathleen Wynn denies that that's why she hired her, that was said. Um, we haven't had too much comment from the AG's office, but Kathleen Wynn has certainly denied that. Yeah, uh, this is more trouble for Horn. He's in a tough primary race. Um, and if he gets through that, he's going to be in a tougher uh, general election. It kind of piles upon everything else he's been going through. The folks that Jeremy mentioned are all political folks. They are. They have to do with the, running the attorney general's office there. Uh, Wynn was a, a political, uh, has been an aide to him. Brett Meekum was a, a Republican Party uh, director. Um, and, and so now there's always a line when you have elected officials and you have people working for them. Some of them are political hacks. Some of them aren't. Some of them are consultants. But there is a line about using resources and, and, and state resources and computers and those types of things and paying somebody based on that. So there's always, you kind of have to walk across the street to run your campaign. Well, it's, and, it's, and obviously she's saying they, have, they aren't doing that. I was going to say, according to Ms. Beatty and according to what uh, Beatty told the uh, Capitol Jeremy here at the Capitol Times, walk across the street, you might as well just crawl and stroll and have a parade across the street. Well, the, the problem for Sarah Beatty and if a, fo a formal complaint is filed with the uh, Secretary of State is, how do you prove that? Um, these are executive level folks. They're not covered. They don't punch a clock. So you can't say, ah, between, you know, 8 and noon, they were doing other work when they're supposed to be doing their state work. There's, there's really no way to account for that. So as we saw with the campaign finance uh, uh, administrative law hearing that we just got a favorable ruling for the AG on, mm -hmm. how do you prove these allegations? Well, what is Horn's response so far? Well, what the AG's office has said is that, um, I mean, it, I mean it, it's all these people have been openly volunteering on the campaign. They say, you know, you're not prohibited from engaging in political activity. As long as they put in an eight-hour day, they can do what they want. That, um, you know, a couple of uh, Brett Meekum and Stephanie Grisham, the official spokesperson, have served, f both served for a while as official campaign spokespeople. When you call them to ask them a campaign question, say, well, I'm on a break right now, or let me call you back during my lunch break. And so the claim is that, um, you know, when people do campaigns, if it's not on the clock or they're putting in their eight hours elsewhere. Um, now, Beatty is, going, Beatty is going to file this complaint, uh, apparently on Monday, they say now. This has been dragging on for a week or so. But what uh, her attorney, Tom Ryan, says is going to be in this is a lot of emails, you know, 
between Beatty and other people in the executive office who are volunteering on the campaign that'll show that this is going on during the workday, during office hours, and that uh, you know it was pretty rampant. She says that they were all instructed to use private email, private laptop, but you know she's got all these right. emails on her private account. The problem, the problem is, is, is any of those emails going to be from Tom Horn? Probably, probably not. It's going to be staff. And just like you saw with Christie in New Jersey, you can blame staff for a lot of things and hope the voters don't don't blame you also. Right. But politically, this is going to turn into a long-running issue for Tom Horn, just as he's hoping to get over the last set of long-running issues: the FBI following him around, the hit-and-run crash, the alleged mistress, uh, the campaign finance violations, which the administrative law judge just last month cleared him of. And then next week, Sheila Polk, the Avapai County attorney, is supposed to say, I will accept that ruling, or no, I, I believe he's guilty and I'm going to reinstate it. And, and I, I realize as well that the complaints, have the complaints with the Secretary of State in clean elections, have they been filed? Are they going to be filed? No, I'm told they're going to be filed on Monday. Uh, I guess they were initially planned to file them today, but one of the agencies requested that uh, it be pushed off. Um, when I'm told the complaint's going to be about an inch thick, but uh, they're going to file this on Monday, they say, with Secretary of State, with clean elections, with the Department of Administration, and with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, all. All this as you're running for re-election. Yeah, I mean, his opponents, both primary and general election, are waiting for voters to see a tipping point. You know, when's enough enough? Is this the, is this the straw that, that breaks the back? But, but Tom has been able to skirt, it, skirt a lot of these things, and he's had some things that have gone his way. But he's had a number of whistleblowers since he's been attorney general come out and accuse him of, of various things. And I, I think it's more of a more, because of the, the general election where you have Democrats will put money into this race to back Rodolini, you'll see a lot of ads if he gets through the primary right. on this. And I talked to Mark Brnovich today, the Republican opponent to Tom Horn, and he said, Listen, you know, this is enough is enough, and he's, you know, if he has the money to run the ads, there's going to be attack ads big time against Tom Horn. And what you've seen a little, at least earlier in the week when uh, Tom Ryan delivered an initial letter kind of threatening litigation to the AG's office is folks over there trying to undermine Beatty's credibility. They say that she's had issues with previous employers, such as the McCain campaign, which uh, you know, I remember the McCain campaign told me they had some problems with her where she accused them of not paying her overtime. They decided they disagreed, but decided to pay her just to make sure it didn't end up in the papers during his reelection. Let the fussing and fighting <laughs> begin on that one, huh? Now, we move over to congressional races <laughs> and folks in Congress at Kirsten Cinema. Uh, accused of using the VA crisis, which we'll talk about in a second, as an opportunity for fundraising, which was, I guess she immediately apologized for this because it was someone else, some, some other element within the campaign they weren't aware of. What, what's going on here? Yeah, you, you get emails from, from all the, the congressional members, their campaigns, talking about various issues, and often they'll have some kind of fundraising pitch at the bottom, or you link to a website and it asks you for money on all types of issues, stand with me, and you know, et cetera, on, on this various issue. And of course, this VA issue with the waiting list and the people that have, that have passed away while they're on the waiting list up at the hospital on Indian School. Um, it, Cinema's campaign sent out, sent out one on that. It was through a consulting firm um, that, that generates these things. And of course, you know, there's a tipping point for there too. What, when do you cross the line? What's, mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, not <coughs> sensitive enough or, or are you going to cross sensibilities in, in doing that? So Schweikert sent out something, I think, uh, kind of related to that also. Um, so you see this a lot out of campaigns on all kinds of issues. A lot of times it's either supporting the president, opposing the president, uh, calling voters' attention to something, and they'll throw a little fundraising pitch in there, and they did that. A lot of people think something like this was maybe in a little poor taste. Right, and Cinema's camp was really, I mean, they backed away from this as quick as possible. They put out a big apology. That as soon as they saw the tweet today that I was going to appear on Horizon, I don't know if you guys got it, but I got an email from them saying, hey, just in case, you know, you forgot, we, this was a mistake, this was a campaign consultant, we didn't mean to do it, don't, you know. And the campaign vendor immediately took responsibility and the cinema camp immediately uh, apologized and those sorts of things. Uh, did allow though for Republicans on the other side, Wendy Rogers and Andrew Walter. Wendy Rogers called it absolutely disgusting and Andrew Walter says it reveals a selfish mindset. Does it also reveal that that sometimes when you're running a campaign, you don't know what the heck's going on and what's getting sent out of your own office? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, especially if you're using the outside vendor. In this case, they actually had the vendor write an email that they released to the press saying, hey, we messed up, this is our bad. We used the wrong template and shouldn't have put this fundraising button on the right. bottom. I think, I think that what the Republicans said was you know, a little strong, but it is your name on it. It's your name on it. You're raising money off of it. They all, all, all both sides do this. This was an issue you probably shouldn't try to raise money off of. And this is, this is a sign of the current instancy of the political 
uh, arena. I mean, we get, you know, the NRCC, the National Republicans, have a, a rapid response team. I mean, literally an hour after a news story happens, they will send out an attack email, but primarily targeting reporters so that we, you know, we right. jump on it and try, you know, maybe they get a point once a week or once every two weeks, but we're inundated with this stuff all the time. Well, and we should mention that the Democrats sent out an email quickly today uh, noting that David Schweikert, according to this Democratic email, David Schweikert uh, calls for the uh, uh, Phoenix VA leadership to resign. I ask for your support as I take the stand and there's an opportunity to go ahead and donate to his campaign. Yeah, there's, off, there's always these links in there too, you know, at the bottom. And, and people that are on their campaign list get all these kind of fundraising requests all the time. They try to pick an issue that people are paying attention to. So, so if it's in the news, people might look at it, click on it, or they open up and read it, and then, oh, I can click on this. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it's innocuous. Once in a while, something like this right. may be across the line. Any little. response from the Schweiker campaign? Uh, I haven't heard from the Schweiker um, campaign. I think the response was similar in that it was a template that got, where something mistakenly got used with the fun, you know, they have a template where they have a fun, you know, contribute now button at the bottom and that actually got used for this email okay. that went out on the VA. Similar to the cinema explanation. Similar, similar I, I, think, cinema. I think voters get tired of this kind of gotcha stuff. It's, you know, they sent this thing out, it's a fundraiser thing, it's a template, a consultant does it. It's not like she typed this up on her own and, and said, oh, we need to raise money off of this. And I think voters get kind of cynical, kind of both parties, right. with these immediate gotcha, how dare you type things. Right, but the Republicans do the same thing. I mean, Andy Tobin's is campaigning on Benghazi. You know? Yeah, I mean, well, to give us more on that, what's that all about? Well, you know, I mean, there's a, a, a new investigation, a special committee that the, the House is setting up based on some new emails that came from the Obama administration under a Freedom of Information Act. Um, that set this whole thing off again in Congress. And Andy Tobin is saying, see, we need to hold the president accountable. We need to, we, and you need to contribute to me. Um, but again, four people died here just like the VA, so. Yeah, and in this case, it wasn't the other party going after him as much as one of his opponents in the Republican primary. Uh, Gary Keeney was pretty quick to put out his own statement saying, look, Andy Tobel don't do anything to raise a buck, vote for me. And the <laughs> national the, Republicans say, don't, no, 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 don't, don't campaign on Benghazi. Uh, indeed, that did come out from the national. Yeah, but this is an issue that the, the, the Republican base, conservative people who watch Fox News, really care about. They're, they're into this story. They think there's a smoking gun there. You know, the Susan Rice stuff, where, you know, when they came out after the, after the thing. They're, they're really think this is a, a, a hardcore kind of issue for them. And so glomming onto that, you know, tries to energize the base because uh, people in the far right kind of uh, want Republicans to focus on that. But again, when, when, when Republicans nationwide say certain things should be above politics, mm -hmm. uh, do you, do, do, are you going a little far by doing this? Uh, nothing's above politics. <laughs> Wow, I got to write that down. That's, that's <laughs> brand new news. All right, so we have uh, Cinema, we have Schweikert, and we have uh, uh, Tobin, all uh, using interesting things. The first two uh, with the Phoenix VA hospital investigation. Where are we on this story? There's a lot of pressure on the, the secretary uh, of VA back in Washington for him to him to step down. They're doing a kind of a full audit of everything of, of a lot of hospitals, kind of a national thing. There's still a lot of focus on Phoenix after what went on there and, and the, the leadership there, which was put on leave. Uh, the senator, uh, Senator McCain and Flake, are still really focused on it. And it's a tough issue because this has been going on for a while. This is multiple administra administrations that this agency's had trouble um, keeping up with cases. And there's a lot of horror stories that you see on, on CNN and, and national media about this. And there's a big focus on, on Phoenix now. So there's a lot of pressure on the administration on this going into the elections. Okay, so so basically, we're, we, are we still having calls for the re resignation of the Phoenix VA uh, folks? The, there are calls for those. The the head of the Phoenix VA is on administrative leave. A couple other folks are on administrative leave. The the inspector general from the VA is in town, and they're now in a couple other states uh, looking at their VA issues. Um, this this story started in Phoenix, kind of slowly gained momentum, and then boom, it blew up. And I guess Colorado now, Texas, I Texas. guess Los Angeles might be the big smoking gun here. Right, and it hasn't, this is not really new. I mean, the Phoenix, the Phoenix thing erupted a couple months ago, but over the last year, there have been hospitals in North Carolina and Florida uh, with similar issues, similar news stories. We have the doctor from here in Phoenix who's the whistleblower claiming that he's been trying to shine some light on this for a long time and this is dragged on for a while and finally just now kind of exploding and uh, now that uh, we're hearing a little more from these people who were put on leave and people who are being dismissed. Right, well Sharon Hellman who's, who's the, the director of the VA uh, hospital here um, adamantly denies that any of this secret waiting list went on. Um, there are concerns that uh, Perhaps some of the staff that are whistleblowers may be disgruntled employees, um, and 
you know, there may be a little smoke there, but, but Hellman is, is adamant that, you know, we did not have a secret waiting list. We were trying to improve things. We, they misunderstood the implementation of a new process. The problem is, is there's so many horror stories uh, throughout the country and here about this agency and the treatment that they give uh, veterans that people don't believe them. And then they stonewall everything. It took a long time for the, for the secretary to come out. She sped away from the CNN investigative reporter in a little sports car um, in, the, in the parking lot. When you kind of do that, people, you know, people watching that, it doesn't pass the smell test. And there's enough horror stories that when you say people misunderstood things, it's hard for people to buy that. We have Eric Shinseki. We have uh, names that come from a variety of administrations. You mentioned this has been going on for a while. Uh, right now, the focus seems to be on certain areas of the country. Politically speaking, wh wh where's the fallout on this? Uh, again, you've got to be careful when you're running for or against something like the VA, especially in the light of this information. I think um, if, if we saw the, the delegation, both the Republican and Democratic congressional delegation in the last two weeks, come together in, in, uni in unison calling for investigations of the VA. Everybody wants to have an investigation of the VA. So, it, you know, where's the political fallout? I'm not sure if it, if it ends up on the Democrats. Um, you know, you can easily fall on the Republicans because they haven't funded it well enough. I mean, everybody hasn't given enough money to the VA. I think that's clear that they're they're overwhelmed. They they have a massive amounts of of, ca of casualties and. World War II and Korean War vets that are going through the system? I think the one thing you could see is you have somebody like Wendy Rogers who, who served in the military, or McSally, where, where they, they're a veteran and, and they could play this up as a challenge or two to an incumbent against a, an, a, a very unpopular Congress. Both sides, not really a partisan issue. And maybe voters in, in, the, in a tight race might look at that and, and see them as kind of symbolic of maybe the need, the need to change But I can't see like somebody losing a race, you know, some voters generally just picking somebody out and saying, I'm not going to vote for them. I blame them for this. But if there's a, a veteran running, it might help them. And, but, and on the other hand, we've already seen kind of the dangers of trying to, you know, hinge your campaign on this issue, you know, between Sinema mm -hmm. and Schweikert. And, you know, I suppose a, vet, you know, a veteran could run, you know, some of these candidates could definitely run saying, you know, I want to clean these things up. But you have to kind of tread carefully, especially when it comes to fundraising, I guess. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's keep it moving here, boy. Quiet. City of Phoenix. Phoenix City Council votes for pay cuts to Phoenix Police as far as that contract is concerned. That was uh, quite an exhibition there the other night. Yeah, that was a Machiavellian, uh, a lot of political infighting. Uh, they voted five to four to cut police pay. Police wanted to be kind of exempted from these kind of across the board cuts the, the city is doing. I think they have a 37, 38 million dollar shortfall. And you end up having the fiscal conservatives, Jim Waring and, and Sal DeCicio, four of them siding with the police not to cut pay. And you kind of ha and you had the Mayor Stanton and Kate Gallego and, and Laura Pastor and some of the more, I guess, more liberal folks voting for the pay cuts. The police union is, is a very powerful force down there. And you saw a split between them and the firefighters. Uh, rank and file police are very frustrated because their overtime has been cut, they're going to face some, some pay cuts, and they, they, they claim they don't have the, the boots on the ground that you see in other cities similar to Phoenix. There's a lot of frustrations there, and so they're angry at a lot of people right now. Right. And the Phoenix police came out today and said, we're going to collect 17,000 signatures and get this on the ballot. They've got 30 days to do it. And who knows, maybe, you know, 2,000 police officers and their families can collect. 16 or 20 or 25,000 you'd need to, to eliminate, uh, you know, bad signatures. And if that, something signatures. like that goes on the ballot, they probably, they probably win. People would side with public safety yeah. in, in, in a campaign like but that. It would be, I think they would have a pretty easy argument to, to make to voters in, in sound bites and mailers. Right, and, and Phoenix was in kind of a tough position. I mean, they've got about a you know, $1.3 billion general fund, um, give or take. Uh, they were $37 million short. They wanted to take half of that out of, out of employee salaries, which is a, as many businesses are, and government especially, it's a it's a huge chunk of the expenditures, and so. But they had to split it up among all the unions. You can't just give under the contracts. You, if one person gets a raise, everybody gets a raise. And this, is, and this is interesting. They kind of transcended some political lines, created some strange political bedfellows, especially with Sal DeCicio, who's known as very combative with the unions and very and on a, been on a crusade against pension spiking, supporting you know requests from the police that would include this pension spiking. Yeah, that, that, that it was an interesting play, yeah. I think, by Gallego yeah. uh, late on, basically making sure that those who were voting against this particular idea and for the other contract were voting for pension spiking, including 
Mr. DeCicio. Yeah, yeah, she, she sub submitted a, what the police wanted and, and included the, the, the pension, the existing pension policies that he rallied to change, but it didn't have the pay cut in there. So the police liked this. So DeCicio, Waring, Bill Gates, Nowakowski voted for it. And then Gallego, who put this forward, didn't vote for it. And it could kind of cut both ways because in the pension spiking, it does, you know, it does put Sal in, in kind of a compromised position, but he sided with police and police are pretty popular. Gallego is a freshman. She's first in there, her and Laura Pastor both, both voted to cut uh, you know, the police pay. Does that come back and hurt them? Her husband is running for Ed Pastor's uh, congressional seat. What, is there any impact there? There's not a lot of big political constituencies that, that get out the vote in, in locally. Firefighters and police are two of them. And lost in this argument, I went through a bunch of the Phoenix, uh, City of Phoenix budget documents that I just, because I like doing that. <laughs> and they have the city, one of the reasons the city has a $37 million deficit is because they've had to put two or three times that amount into extra police pensions right. in the last few years. Yes. So, you know, I mean, on one hand, you know, the reason we have a deficit is because of this pension spiking and because of their pension plan. So the interesting thing is, like, we look at Phoenix City Council politics, it's not Greg Stanton that's the center point. He was, he was pretty low-key during this. This was the city manager's proposal, it was his budget. It's Sal DeCicio. Everybody, the unions don't like Sal DeCicio. People are up there always well, wagging, and, and, wagging their finger at Sal DeCicio. Right, he's the he, lightning rod. He's, he's the lightning rod, and he is, he's kind of the center of everything. But now, now does this move by Gallego, though? I mean, does he get one more union vote or voice of support because he now technically supports pension spiking, or does Gallego lose one more union vote or police support because she kind of did the old Charlie Brown with the football thing? Well, when you know, Sal, Sal's constituency is not the unions, you know, obviously. So he's more with the fiscal conservatives, folks in Ahwatukee, um, you know, Republican folks. If he wants to run for mayor, that's a challenge for him. If he just wants to be a backbencher and the voice of reason and a lightning rod, mm -hmm. then, then, which I think he's good, that's, that's his role there, then he's fine. The question is for her, you know, does she face some kind of uh, challenge next time uh, if the police hold this against her and does this impact her husband's run at all? All right, uh, before we go, we had uh, the Arizona Republic looking at internal polls. Uh, they didn't see whose internal polls, but they all seem relatively similar. You got Bennett, this is for governor on the Republican. Republican side. You got Bennett, you got Smith, you got Jones, you got Ducey, but the, the focus of the story seemed to be you don't got Ducey as much as maybe some folks thought you would. That's true. You know, uh, polling at this part of the game is, is relatively unreliable, and these are all internal polls that they're citing, but you know, Doug Ducey set himself out. He was the first candidate to do a formal kickoff. This was back in, if you remember, 1062, the, the, yes. the big issue earlier this you know, legislative session. He he went out on a multi-city tour of the state. He was around the state, hoping that he would get traction. Well, his name ID is, is no better than anybody else's at this point in the race. No one has broken out, and, and Ducey surely hasn't. Yeah, um, a lot of people have, have kind of pegged Ducey as the front runner for a long time, and even though nobody, you know, most of the polling within the margin of error. They all show, you know, half to two thirds undecided. But it does might be kind of alarming for Ducey. You know, he's uh, raised a lot. He's spent a lot. He's up on TV now, and he doesn't really seem to have moved the needle at all. Whereas Jones, who's been on the air for longer, appears like she has gotten a bit of traction. Yeah, I mean, Ducey's got a lot of money. He's a Cold Stone uh, CEO. He ran for treasurer, obviously won. Got a lot of endorsements. Got Kathy Harridge. Got John Kyle. Uh, he's got the right to life, got Free Enterprise Club, and again, the needle hasn't moved yet for him. Jones is getting a look at people because she's new. She's the only woman in the race. She's been reaching out to a lot of the, the churches uh, around trying to get that kind of segment of, of the primary vote. I think people are giving her a look. There's no, there's no Sal DeCicio in this race. There's no lightning rod. There's no personality. We were talking about what's the issue, M Medicaid, right. um, and, and does that really engage people? And, and we should mention on the Democratic side, there is no race. And now, does that help or hurt a Fred Duvall? I mean, we, look, we're talking more about the Republicans than we are the Democrats. You know, I, I don't think it hurts him. Um, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, we're sitting here on May 9th, and it is, you know, we are the people and the political people around the state are the ones who care about the August primary right now. In the coming weeks, we'll start getting momentum for that. The, the Republicans will be out in force and the governor trying to really coalesce that support. But Fred Duvall is going to be on the ballot. He's going to get his, his, de his Democratic people. Um, when we move into October is when you really w start watching that to see if, it, if it's hurt him that he didn't have a... Agree with that. Game. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some upsides and downsides to not having the uh, you know, having a primary challenger for Duvall. You know, the downside, of course, he's not getting the press, he's not getting attention. I don't think he really likes that he's not getting much attention. But I think that's far outweighed by the upside, which is you don't have to spend any money. You don't really have to do anything. He can just stockpile this war chest and, you know, be sitting on a million dollars or more by the time that, you know, a Republican challenger who is probably tapped out at that point emerges. All right. Very good. Good, guys. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, an update on Arizona's economy and what's expected for the rest of the year, and a reaction from the business community on the recently completed legislative session. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.